자유의 이름으로 자유를 파괴하다. 인간은 묘한 존재입니다. 물질적 풍요가 인간의 정신을 후퇴시키고 육체적인 자유가 인간의 영혼을 욕망의 노예로 만들기도 하죠. 개인 차원뿐 아니라 국가, 아니 전 세계적인 차원에서 이런 아이러니가 이루어지고 있습니다. 유대 기독교적 전통 가운데 번영을 구가했던 서구사회가 프랑스 68혁명 세대로부터 시작된 자유주의와 상대주의의 물결에 휩쓸리면서 어떻게 세락해가고 있는가를 보여줍니다. 글로벌 성혁명을 원했던 세력들의 면면을 다양한 측면에서 부각시키고 오늘날 전 세계적으로 불고 있는 성규범 해체 현상의 배후에 있는 사상들을 살펴봄으로써 우리에게 새로운 시각을 제공해주 유럽에서 이루어지는 국가에 의한 폭발적 성교육 내용을 소개하고 있습니다. 자에서 육세 아이들이 자유 행위를 통해 성적인 즐거움을 처음 맛보도록 해야 한다거나 9에서 12세 아이들에게 스스로 성경험을 할지 말지에 대한 의식적인 결정을 내릴 권리가 있다고 가르치고 있습니다. 지금 서구사회에서는 전통적인 의미의 결혼과 가족 제도가 무너지고 있습니다. 남녀의 성 정체성을 부인하고 성별을 스펙트럼으로 인식하는 젠더 이데올로기와 남자와 여자를 화해 불가능한 적으로 만드는 급진적인 페미니즘, 자유와 간용의 이름으로 오히려 개인의 양심과 젊음을 억압하는 현실에 직면해 있습니다. 인류는 언제나 자유롭고 풍요로운 유토피아를 꿈꿔왔지만 늘 그랬듯이 그 꿈은 실패로 끝났습니다. 그런데도 인류는 성혁명을 통한 또 다른 유토피아를 꿈꾸고 있습니다. 이런 오만이 어떤 결과를 낳게 될지. And maybe the most important event in my life, which brings me in that I speak here, is my conversion to Catholic faith. And faith opened my eyes to the truth of God and to the truth of the human being. Dear friends in South Korea, I'm speaking from Germany. We are very lucky to have these electronic means of communication in times. of the corona pandemic. Three years ago, I had the great privilege of visiting your country as a speaker of the conference Life, Family and Honor. It was a joyful event to meet all these people from many continents who fight for freedom, especially the freedom of the family, for the moral foundation of society and family, for the acknowledgement that there is a loving God above us to whom we are responsible. We are aware that our societies fall apart, that a new totalitarianism is arising, that the destruction of the family causes social chaos and immense suffering for millions and millions of people. We are, we are in a war between the culture of death and the culture of life. It is a war between Marxist atheists who want to establish equality and of believers in God who want to establish justice. It is a war between those who will establish a totalitarian dictatorship by manipulation of mass consciousness, the jettison of law and the use of violence, and those who work for the kingdom of God, and therefore fight for freedom and justice. They know that God, nature and reason will win this war. At the core of our present situation is the deregulation of all moral restrictions of sexuality. The human being is the only creature endowed with free will. We are not bound by instinct as the animals are. So we need moral values, that is, the discrim discrimination between good and bad, to make decisions how we use our freedom. The sexual norms belong to the operating system of a society because they have enormous impact on the whole cultural edifice of a society. Therefore, Every society fiercely protects sexual norms with social and legal penalties. Until the student revolution of 1968, monogamy was the standard of the once Christian culture. One man and one woman bonding in marriage to give life to children and bring them up in the shelter of belonging to their parents. 
Now, sexual morality has been turned upside down. It's the permissiveness of sexual promiscuity, homosexuality, and even the choice of one's sex that the law is forcing through under the deceptive banner of non-discrimination and equality. Western societies have gone down this road into the destruction of the basis of family and society with an incredible speed, and there's no end to it. Asian countries were slower in overturning the fundamental value system. But the sexual revolution is indeed global. It is the agenda of the United Nations, the European Union, and other supranational organizations. It is infiltrating every nation and every society. Revolutions usually are an answer to the demands of suppressed and suffering people. But where are the masses who demand same-sex marriage, the freedom to change your sex at will, or the dissolution of parenthood by artificial reproduction? They do not exist. The sexual revolution is a top-down revolution brought about by the elites of power and money who use small and smallest sexual minorities to wage war on the traditions that once supported the family of father, mother, and children. Now, in your country, once more, the Liberal Justice Party of South Korea is making a new attempt to ban, quote, all kinds of discrimination based on gender, disability, age, language, country of origin, sexual orientation, physical condition, academic background, and any other reason. End of quote. Justice Party representative Young Hae Young said in a press conference, quote, a law banning comprehensive discrimination will be a means to keep our dignity and safety. There are people who are discriminated against without reason in political, economic, social, and cultural life. Discrimination leads to hate and violence that denies human dignity. Nobody deserves to be discriminated against because they are weak or social minority. End of quote. The degree of unclarity and confusion in this justification for the proposed bill is amazing. It is like a cloud of fog that hides the true intention of the law. The characteristics of sex, age, physical condition, sexual orientation, cultural background and academic background make up the identity of a person. To recognize the difference between people has nothing to do with discrimination. Discrimination means that someone incurs disadvantages in political, economic, social, and cultural life because of these differences. The opposite is true. In order not to discriminate, we must take these differences into account. Only this way justice can be established. The denial of the difference, the false claim of equality, in reality is a denial of human dignity, and that leads to hate and violence. A human society cannot achieve justice by the futile attempt to eradicate all differences. Do we want women to fight with a weapon at the front line of a war? Do we want that two men or two women can marry and produce children by buying the missing genetic material? Do we want that women can grow a beard by taking hormones, give birth to a child, and say that they are fa the father? Do we want men to compete with women in sports? Let us go back to the word and the meaning of discrimination. The Latin word discrimen means distinction or difference. The person endowed with free will must distinguish between right and wrong, good and evil, to handle this freedom in such a way as to succeed in his own life and not to bring harm to his fellow human beings. 
For the person who knows that he is answerable to God, this di distinction between good and evil is essential for his eternal salvation. If he is forbidden by law to make this distinction, then religious freedom in reality is banned. Parents, teachers and pastors will not be allowed to pour, pass on Christian values to the next generation. There's a great misunderstanding on the side of the cultural revolutionists. To distinguish between good and evil is not to discriminate against people. Every person, regardless of his sexual orientation or any other personal traits, is equal in dignity and every person enjoys legal protection against liberal harassment and exclusion. For Christians, the principle is to hate sin and to love the sinner. Whereas for atheists, cultural revolutionists, there is no sin because there is no God and anybody who holds on to moral standards is hated and silenced and threatened in a social and material existence. Anti-discrimination or equality legis legislation is a means to achieve this by law. In recent years, almost all Western nations have adopted so-called equality laws. They are an instrument to silence Christians who are not willing to compromise their faith. Let me give you a few examples of legal cases. There are now thousands of cases where equality laws are used to silence especially Christians. Consider the case of Peter and Hazel Mary Bull, an elder, elderly Christian couple who operated a small bed and breakfast guest house in south of England. True to their faith, they only rented their rooms to heterosexual married couples. This hadn't caused any problems for about 20 years, but in 2008, after the adoption of equality legislation in the United Kingdom, they received a letter from an organization called Stonewall, the UK's leading LGBT organization, whose slogan is acceptance without exception. The bulls were warned that they were breaking the law. The following month, the, a same-sex couple turned up at their doorstep and demanded a double room. The bulls declined, explaining their long-standing policy. This time, the police were called, and their property was called, and the bulls were sued. They received hate mails and death threats, and their property was vandalized. After being dragged through the courts for five years, their guest house business was ultimately destroyed. Or the case of Jack Phillips, owner of the Masterpiece Cake Shop in the United States, Colorado. In 2012, two men asked Jack Phillips to create a wedding cake celebrating their same-sex marriage. Jack politely declined because of religious beliefs about marriage. The Colorado Civil Rights Commission judged that Jack had violated anti-discrimination law. The case went up to the Supreme Court of the United States. The court found that the government was wrong to punish Jack for peacefully living out his beliefs in the marketplace. Jack hoped that after four years of legal struggle, he would now again be able to lead a normal and peaceful life. But he underestimated the relentlessness of the LBTIQ lobby. A transgender woman turned up and asked him to decorate a cake for her gender transition. Another lawsuit followed. The obvious intention of such acts is to threaten anybody with the ruin of his existence if he dares to resist this agenda. Jack Phillips could only take this path of legal resistance because the organization Alliance Defending Freedom 
took on his case. If you go to their website, you will find many cases where the new equality laws are, be, are being used to curtail freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, the right of parents to educate their own children according to their values. Should you yourself incur prosecution in your own country, you can apply for help to Alliance Defending Freedom International. There's a fundamental distinct contradiction between anti-discrimination and the freedom of religion. Democratic freedoms, freedoms as they are codified 1948 in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are founded on the Christian concept of man and his inviolable dignity. These true human rights are only respected in reality if a society is still predominantly Christian. If Christian faith never was the foundation of society or if it is fading, as it now does in Western countries, human rights are undermined, redefined and replaced by laws that establish a new atheistic and hedonistic ideology. Hedonistic means do whatever increases your pleasure. Christians believe that God has created man as man and woman and called them to procreate within the bond of marriage. This is the message of the Bible from beginning to end. Jesus leaves no doubt that marriage is a sacred bond that cannot be broken. Christians keep the commandments of God because they love God and because they know and believe that this is a condition of receiving the grace of eternal salvation. So they cannot comply with the new laws that enforce the total acceptance of hedonistic sexuality. Christians do not force their morality on others, but they must be able to proclaim their faith, act in accordance with it, and educate their children accordingly. That is the content of the human right of freedom of religion, which is essential to democracy. The atheist revolutionaries want to suppress the biblical message. For them it is discrimination, even though they have all the rights to live their lifestyle as they want. That is why pastors have been heavily fined and even imprisoned if they quote from the Bible, or why students were excluded from university, or why employees are dismissed from their job if they hold on to the biblical message. The human right of freedom of religion and anti-discrimination laws implant an obvious contradiction into law. In most cases, the freedom of religion loses the battle. To somehow mediate between the human right of freedom of religion and equality laws, legislators have sought have tried to balance the competing interests by providing exemptions for religious organizations. But if we accept the idea that religious freedom is discriminatory and can only be permitted under an exemption, the public's attitude towards the once sacrosanct freedom will forever be changed. On top of it, Exemptions are always vulnerable to future narrowing. They will never be enough to satisfy those who think religious believers are discriminating and getting away with it, says Paul Coleman from Alliance Defending Freedom. Whatever cultural revolutionists achieve, achieve it is never enough. One example. First, they demand civil partnership for homosexuals, then same-sex marriage, 
then adoption, then artificial production of a child by buying what they don't have, the genetic material of the other sex, and renting the womb of a woman. They push for acceptance in Christian churches by demanding blessings and Christian rights for a marriage between same-sex people that is not a marriage. It is not enough to succeed in having all these unnatural human rights granted by law, but any voice must be silenced who stands up for another concept of man and for the rights of the child. This is because man is created with an inner compass for moral truth, which we call conscience. The voice of conscience can be muted by an immoral behavior. But if the compass of truth is awakened in a person that has chosen this kind of lifestyle, it causes pain. And this pain may be turned into a hatred. Of course, the ultimate victory of any revolution is the transformation of the human being according to their ideology. That is why all revolutionaries set in motion as soon as they have the power to do so to transform the children. At the core of the present revolution is to overthrow any moral limitations of sexuality, children must be sexualized from the cradle all the way through kindergarten and school. It is the agenda of the United Nations, the European Union and national governments of the West. To give you just one example, the International Technical Guidance on Sexuality Education published by UNESCO, UNICEF, UNAIDS, UN Women and the World Health Organization. International Technical Guidance on Sexuality Education. I remember the shock of people in South Korea and Taiwan when I showed them material for sex education in German textbooks. They couldn't believe that kindergarten children were encouraged to naked doctor plays and masturbation. Asian countries obviously have not proceeded that far with the sexualization of children by force of state as Western nations have. Teach your children to masturbate from babyhood onwards, teach them to accept homosexual and transgender lifestyles, change the concept of family by introducing rainbow families in picture books, destabilize their sexual identity as boy and girl, train them, train them to be experts of contraception before puberty, make abortion an easy way out, give them puberty-delaying hormones if they so wish, even though it will ruin their life. Numerous times, parents appealed to the European Court of Human Rights to be allowed to withdraw their children from this kind of indoctrination, but without success. Their cases were not even accepted. The reason is that the European Court of Human Rights has itself been converted into an agency of the destruction of the Christian foundation of Western democracies. An analysis of the European Center of Law and Justice from 2020 found that 20% of the judges of the court were former members of George Soros NGOs. That means they are not independent and impartial judges, but activists in the robe of a judge. It seems the same strategies were applied also to the Constitutional Court in Germany. In the name of non-discrimination, the court ruled in 2018 that a third gender must be introduced called diverse. Now, if you have some rare physical abnormality called intersexuality, or if you can't make up your mind whether you are a man or a woman, you can opt for diverse in your identity documents. When an employer advertise, advertises open jobs, 
he has to search for male, female, diverse employees. Anything else would be a discrimination and would be fined heavily. The reasoning of the Supreme Court was that people with biological abnormalities of their sexual organs were discriminated if they had to register either as man or woman. There are only very few people who have biological abnormalities of their sexual organs, but there are 99.99% .99 of the population who will be confused. The strategies of the cultural revolutionists are highly sophisticated, organized, and long-term. They make use of all methods of social engineering, especially the media and entertainment industry. They reach for the highest levels of power in governments and international organizations, the legal system, and academia. They infiltrate the church the last bulwark against of resistance, they adapt their strategies to the specific conditions of any nation, culture, and religion. The ideological breakthrough was the formulation of gender ideology by the US American philosopher Judith Butler in a book she published 1990 with the title Gender Trouble, Feminism and the Subversion of Identity. This is what she is after and puts plainly into the title The Subversion of Identity of Man and Woman. She claims that our biological sex can be changed at will into the social sex a person fancies. In several nations, this has now, now found entry into law. You can choose your sex at will without the need of any transition measures. So in the passport, a man can be registered as a woman, a woman as a man, and both as diverse, something undefined in between. Transgender activist Ricky Wilsons expresses in a nutshell what the battle is about. Make the binary burn, ending our culture's obsession with what is male and what is female will be our salvation, so says Ricky Wilsons. A document called the Yogyakarta Principles maps out the LGBTIQ agenda in detail. A group of so-called renowned experts of human rights with no official authorization formulated these nine, 29 principles and were allowed to present them in the Palais des Nations of the United Nations in Geneva to give them a glow of authority. Ten years later, the Yogyakarta Plus 10 principles were added, quote, additional principles and state obligations on the application of international human rights law in relation to sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and sex characteristics to complement the Yogyakarta principles. All these are new invented expressions which you just heard, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and sex characteristics, which have the purpose to change the value system of which our societies are founded. Many governments have endorsed these principles and committed themselves to their implementation. The judicial key to the enforcement of these principles is the introduction of sexual identity into anti-discrimination legislation. The principles demand that 
all countries of the world taking measures to change their constitutions, laws, social institutions, police, military, healthcare, education, and their citizens' basic attitudes in order to enforce and legally compel acceptance and privileged status for homosexuality and any other non-heterosexual identities and behaviors. The text of the Yuga Carter Principles clearly exhibits the goals, the methods of obfuscation and the enforcement methods for the global implementation of LGBTIQ agenda. The methods of implementation are hollowing out national sovereignty through UN treaty monitoring bodies in cooperation with the local NGOs, non-government organizations. Supplying financial resources in the millions from the United Nations, the European Union and individual states for these lobby organizations. And act court cases at all levels of the legal system in the name of human rights and anti-discrimination. Change the population's fundamental values by public demonstrations, the Christopher Street Days, portraying the homosexual and transgender lifestyle as normal and attractive in the media and the entertainment industry. Social and legal sanctions against opposition threatening their material existence. The change of language is essential for brainwashing people without them even noticing by inventing new concepts like gender, sexual orientation, sexual identity, sexual expression, homophobia, diversity, and by abusing the noble concept of human rights and anti-discrimination. The Yogyakarta principles are furnished with an activist guide to the Yogyakarta principles. It is a toolbox for the lobby organizations for changing the values and legal basis of sovereign states. Central to this is the language of human rights, which demands rights without any duties. The toolbox contains strategic instructions adaptable to all cultural conditions and links local activists to the world wide web of the cultural revolutionists of the, on the highest levels of power and money. In every country, there's a small minority of homosexual and transgender people to whom now prospects of life are offered. They are supplied with money, education, jobs, and juridical support so they can set to work in their own culture. I've dedicated one whole chapter to the Yogyakarta principles to, because I think it is good to know the plan behind the changes we see happening. You can tick off for every nation what has already been achieved. The question is, how did we get there? How did, we, how did we arrive in a madhouse where reality is denied and fantasy reigns? It has to do with a fundamental change in the concept of human rights. And that has to do with a total reversal in the concept of man. Is there a God? who created man and who endowed him with objective morality through revelation and the voice of conscience in his heart? Or is man his own God? 
I owe the following analysis to an enlightening book by Gregor Püpping, the friend, a French director of the European Center of Law and Justice, which so far has only been published in French under the title Les Droits de l'Homme Dénaturé, The Human Rights of the Unnatural Man. After the unspeakable horrors of World War II, the nations came to a mutual consent that there are natural rights which every human being enjoys simply because he or she is a human being with dignity. They intended to protect man from totalitarian suppression through the state. The concept of inviolable dignity of man is derived from the biblical revelation that God created man in his own image. As man and woman, he created them. This is what we read on the first page of the Bible. This anthropological view of man led to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. Man was seen as a being of flesh and blood, endowed with a reflective reason and free will. He can only live in harmony with himself if the two sides of his nature find a balance, body and mind. Man is also a social being who cannot exist alone. Therefore, he has to find a balance between the desires and wishes of the individual and with society by striving for the common good. Since the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, more than 70 years have passed, in which the concept of human rights has been completely changed. Human rights do no longer define natural rights of the human being, but solely the rights of the individual. These rights defy nature and do not accept anything as given, not even the human body, and its laws of procreation. Anti-natural rights have been devised to fulfill the limitless desires of the individual, the right to voluntarily define one's sex, the right to kill the unborn child, the suffering or the inadequate person. The legal re redefinition of marriage by opening it to same-sex couples. The production of the child by artificial means, denying the child the right to its biological parents. Man has placed himself on the throne of God and dares to transgress all given boundaries by transhuman experiments, mixing creating hybrids of man and machine and man and animal. The body of the human being has lost its meaning. It is now simply material that can be used by the individual at libitum, at will, even to the degree of killing and mutilating it and selling its parts for money. All this is consider considered as liberation and progress. This predominance of the will of the individual over the body corresponds to the predominance of the will of the individual over the common good. The sovereign is no longer God or a king or the majority of the people, but the individual whose rights must be protected against the demands of the society. The concept of common good has disappeared. There is no longer any objective authority to define what is good and what is bad. Good is what the individual wants. The will of the individual is the ultimate arbiter of good and evil. It is plain to the eye 
that a society with this concept of human rights will disintegrate. Thomas Hobbes, philosopher of the 17th century, coined the term in Latin homo homini lupus his. Everyone is a wolf to everyone else. Human beings are not equal in any sense, quite the opposite. Every human being is unique. Their ability to force their will onto others is extremely unequal. Unless man is purified by striving for virtue through the grace of God, he will always strive for power, more power, more wealth, more sex at the expense of others. These differences establish structures of power that lead to suppression and violence. What is the answer of the cultural revolutionists who deny any authority above their own will? Equality. But will equality laws be able to even out the extreme differences of power and wealth? Of course not. It is a delusion, the spawn of atheistic humanism, which can lead to nothing else but the reign of very few over billions of the very weak. Equality laws strip the person of the main features of his or her identity, the sex of their body, the roots in their family, nation, religion. Identity as man or woman, as a member of a specific family and a specific nation, making sense of his existence through religion, makes a person strong. Without it, the individual will be a naked nothingness that can be manipulated and exploited. Equality laws are a direct path into a new totalitarianism. Equality laws and the interest of people like Bill Gates and George Soros. Between them and the billions of human beings on this earth there will never be equality. Man does not strive for equality because it destroys his identity. He yearns for justice. That is what a wise ordering of state, law and society aims to establish. Equalities Laws can never establish justice because justice acknowledges the differences of man and strives to give each his due, in Latin, zuum cuique, which is a basic law of justice. To achieve justice is a never-ending battle against the wolf in each human person. Justice is founded on the respect for the right to life and the dignity of every human being codified in law. The victims of an equality law are freedom of religion and freedom of speech, which are both essential for democracy. Equality or anti-discrimination rights are backed up by so-called hate speech laws that criminalize speech based on vague and subjective definitions of offense. What is more, a basic principle of law is being reversed. The defendant has to prove that he did not violate the rights of the plaintiff. How is this possible if the feeling of being offended is the proof? All these laws only seem to work in one direction. They give free reign and protection to the cultural revolutionaries and they ostracize, silence and criminalize any opposition. 
which usually comes from Christians. No wonder that increasingly churches around the world are vandalized and even put on fire. The madness that has befallen our moment of history seems limitless. Here are two more examples. In November 2020, this month, Lord Mayor of Perth, Australia, with the name Basil Sempilas, dare to say in his radio show that physical anatomy denotes one's sex. He bluntly declared, quote, if you've got a penis, mate, you're a bloke. If you've got a vagina, you are a woman. Game over. End of quote. The comment was made in response to a story of a woman who refused to view her child as either male or female until he or she reached the age of 18. The consequences for the mayor, a petition demanding his resignation, online backlash and hate speech, vandalizing of his house. The Lord Mayor promptly apologized, saying, my comments do not reflect my values. The council house was lit up in rainbow colors. Or consider another recent case that happened in the United Kingdom also this month, November 2020. Freddie McConnell, a biological female identifying as male and looking like a male, interrupted her daily hormone intake, bought sperm from a sperm bank and gave birth to a child. The BBC covered the story with the headline, The Dad Who Gave Birth. Freddie wanted to be registered as the father in the birth certificate of the child and took the case all the way up to the UK Supreme Court. Freddie was supported by the LGBT lobby group Stonewall, who saw this case as a key for recognizing all parents for what they are. She was not successful the UK Supreme Court declined to hear her case. She, or should we say Stonewall, would take the case to the European Court of Human Rights to fight for the human right of a woman who identifies as a man to deprive her child from his biological mother and father. This is how trans activists win a relentless willingness to fight for every inch of territory in any courtroom over and over again. What are we to do as Christians? Dear friends, stay sane. If you see a green bottle before you, and everybody else says the bottle is brown, stick to your perception. Experiments show that most people give in to the denial of reality if everybody else around them does so for a while. We are in a process of global brainwashing. If people expose themselves continually to mainstream media, they will not even notice that they are brainwashed. Their convictions and values begin to change without them being aware of it, without a rational consideration and debate with oneself or others. The need to be accepted by one's social environment is extremely strong in the human psyche. It overrides the level of opinions convictions and values, unless they have deep roots. A person must be strong to say the bottle is green if everybody else says the bottle is brown. 
It may cost a person acceptance, job, status, and at some point maybe even his life, if he sticks to the truth. How do we gain this strength? By practicing our faith, by living what we believe. The situation is as old as humanity. People in power cannot tolerate the truth that challenges their power or their ideology. The first 400 years of Christianity, every Christian had to face the possibility of paying for his faith with his life. And innumerable Christians did so over the last 2,000 years. Living our faith means to establish a love relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. How do we establish a love relationship with Jesus? By prayer, by listening to the word of God, and by doing what we hear. This is what Jesus says in the Sermon of the Mount. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Matthew 7 24 to 28. Indeed, the floods come and the winds blow and beat on the house of the once Christian societies and they beat on our own house. But we have a twofold hope which nobody can take from us. The hope that after the short stretch of our own life, Eternal joy in the presence of God is awaiting us if, if we use our talents for the kingdom of God and trust in the merciful compassion of the Lord. Secondly, we have the hope and the faith that it is God who will win this battle. He has created us, he has become man, he has gone to the cross, he resurrected from the dead, and he will return on the clouds of heaven with power and glory. Let us stay sane, rooted in the truth of man and God. Then we will be light and salt to the world. Thank you.